Welcome to Empires Explained, a channel dedicated to uncovering the mysteries behind the rise and fall of the greatest empires in human history. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for fascinating videos every Sunday. 5,000 years ago, the area, known as Mesopotamia, saw huge changes in human society and behaviors, leading to the founding of the first great modern civilization. The fertile land between the Euphrates and Tigris River saw human society transform from the primitive nomadic bands of hunter-gatherers into farmers and city builders with complex societies. This area was the location for the emergence of modern agriculture and inventions such as wheeled vehicles, the smelting of bronze and development of writing, art, and science. The city-states, which emerged in this ear, were notable for their independence from one another. Each had its own king, laws, religions, and cultures, which were protected against incursions from the outside. Each controlled a small area in the immediate vicinity of the city, and none was powerful enough to dominate its neighbors. During the 24th century BC, a meek gardener of these city-states somehow managed to overthrow the king and take the throne for himself. This man had the ambition to reach far beyond his own city. He saw himself controlling the entirety of the Mesopotamia and dominion over all the other city-states. He succeeded in this ambition, and so was born the first human empire, the Akkadian Empire, which became the most powerful force in the world during its time. Whilst it existed, this empire introduced much that was new, including a complete system of writings, laws, written treaties between nations, and even the very first postal service. This is the story of the Akkadian Empire. The primary human societies were tribes of nomadic hunter-gatherers. They moved from place to place, following game and picking fruits and berries when they could be found. Their houses were temporary affairs built of skins and wooden poles so they could be easily transported to other locations. These people left no trace of themselves. Almost every member of such a society was involved in the acquisition of food from day to day. There simply was not time to allow people to learn how to do anything else. Around 3300 BC, a new people arrived in the fertile land between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. No one knew where they came from, but they bought with them a completely different way of life. They used irrigation to make it possible to plant and cultivate crops. They kept animals, which they used for meat, wool, and milk, meaning they didn't have to move around in search of food and their dwellings became permanent places, which grew over time into towns. The arrival of these people, we call the Sumerians, was not a conquest in the conventional sense. They did not initially fight with existing hunter-gatherers on a large scale or use military force to delineate their territories. However, their ability to farm meant that there were food surpluses in Sumerian society, and not all the members were forced to spend their time gathering food. Instead, some became priests, negotiating between the people and the many gods, and others became artisans, producing tools, weapons, and other items. Over time, the hunter-gatherers who had previously inhabited southern Mesopotamia were quietly squeezed out by the more productive, creative, efficient, and settled Sumerians. Over time, buildings in Sumerian towns begin to be constructed using mud bricks, and these grew into cities protected by walls. These cities, the first in human history, became individual states with their own rulers, laws, and religious practices. Each city had its own ziggurat and temple complexes in which priests offered sacrifices and offerings to the god of their city. By 2500 BC, there were half a million Sumerians of which the vast majority lived in cities including Uruk, Kish, Nippur, Ur, Lagash, Uma, and Ur. The two largest and most powerful Sumer cities were Uma and Lagash. There were frequent conflicts between the two for control of southern Mesopotamia. The part of Mesopotamia, which became Sumer, was very small. It had a total land area of just 14,000 square kilometers, and the flat alluvial plain and the lack of natural features, such as mountains, meant that most Sumer cities were within sight of one another. In the 25th century BC, Ianatum, the king of the Sumer city, of Lagash, conquered several cities in the area. His conquest led to another landmark in human history, 
the first organized battle in which the professional soldiers of two opposing factions faced and killed each other on behalf of their leaders. Despite the fighting between cities, life was generally good for Sumerians. Advances in agriculture and the buildings of canals and drainage systems meant food was plentiful and surpluses were traded to ensure that Sumer people had access to anything they might want, leaving time to develop writing and advances in science. A few decades after the death of Iyanatum, the king of the Sumer city of Uma, Lugalzaga Si, came to power and continued Iyanatum's work in unifying the major Sumer cities. Under the rule of Lugalzaga Si, Sumer was unified for the first time, and fighting between the city-states ended. But just as it seemed that Sumer was headed for an extended time of peace and prosperity, it faced a new threat from the north of Mesopotamia. We know a great deal about Sumerian society and the Sumer city-states, because the Sumerians developed writing and used clay as the medium on which they wrote. Many of these cuneiform tablets have been recovered, and there is now a good general understanding of the Sumer language. However, there is less reliable information about the Semitic-speaking people from the north. Very few artifacts have been recovered regarding the northerners, so most of the information we have comes from Sumerian sources. The northern part of Mesopotamia contained several towns and city-states, but Semitic-speaking people who were ethnically separate from the Sumerians occupied these areas. In appearance, northerners were also different in that Sumerian men shaved their heads and faces whereas the men from the north retained their hair and grew long beards. However, these people shared many religious beliefs with the Sumerians, and their cities and societies were organized in a similar way, with priests at the top and slaves at the bottom. In the Sumerian city of Kish, a younger cupbearer was employed by King Ur-Zababa. Kish was an important and powerful city-state at this time, and one of the few which remained at least nominally independent. The role of cupbearer to the king carried great importance. This young man had an odd background. He was said to be the illegitimate son of a priestess of the temple Inanna and an unknown father. Priestesses were not allowed to have children, and the baby was said to have been set adrift in a reed basket on the Euphrates River. He was found by a gardener in a royal household of Kish, who took in and raised the boy as his own son. The gardener, named Aki, is believed to have been of Semitic origin, and raised the boy as a Semite. Somehow the boy overcame his strange origins and became cupbearer to the king. Cupbearers were responsible for organizing all royal dining, looking after the gold and silver royal plates, goblets, and cutlery, and for tasting all the king's food and drink to ensure that it was safe. Cupbearers were also sometimes responsible for carrying secrets and confidential messages to and from the king, and often had more personal duties. King Lugal Zagasi decided that he would complete his conquest of Sumer by occupying the city of Kish. When King Urzubaba heard that the warlord was approaching with his army, he was so terrified that he is said to have sprinkled his legs. He decided to send this young cupbearer as an envoy with a message for Lugal Zagasi. We do not know what the message said, but apparently it concluded with a request for Lugal Zagasi to execute the cupbearer who brought it. Instead, Lugal Zagasi invited the young man to join him, and the two descended on Kish. The city was quickly taken, and Urzubaba fled into exile. It is difficult to know precisely what happened next. Most of the information we have comes from the Babylonians and Sumerian legends, but it seems that the young cupbearer was given a military command on behalf of Lugal Zagasi. He was so successful in this that the king came to see him as a rival, and soon the two were at war. The young cupbearer took the Sumer city of Uruk and made it his base of operations. Lugal Zagasi marched out of Kish with his army, and the two met in a battle in which the forces of Lugal Zagasi were utterly defeated. Lugal Zagasi was captured and taken to the city of Nupur in chains. The young man then conquered the city of Kish, and in 2334 BC proclaimed himself King of Kish. At that time he also took a new name for himself, King Sargon. He took as his divine protector the goddess Inanna, symbol of love, sensuality, fertility, and war. Most of the pieces of the early story of Sargon's war rise to power was recollected in the form of legends handed down to subsequent generations. For example, a 7th century BC Assyrian text has been discovered which supposedly has Sargon recounting his own history. My mother was a high priestess, my father I knew not. My high priestess mother conceived me, 
In secret, she bore. Me. She set in a basket of rushes with bitumen she'd sealed my lid. She cast me into the river which rose over me. The river bore me up and carried me to Aki, the drawer of water. Aki, the drawer of water, took me as his son and reared me. This story predates the biblical story of Moses, and we do not know how accurate it was. What we do know is that the story of Sargon's humble beginnings gave him great appeal to the common people of Sumer. He quickly began to expand his power to the other city-states in the area, but it was clear that this ambition went far beyond the conquest of southern Mesopotamia. After becoming king of Kish in 2334 BC, Sargon entered the historical record. After this period, there are a number of contemporary texts, which specifically mentions King Sargon. He was clearly a skilled military leader, and it did not take long for him to bring all the neighboring city-states of Sumer under his control. In each, he put in place new leaders and administrators who were Semitic-speaking people loyal to him. From this time, the official language of Sumer cities changed to become Semitic, though in most other ways they continued as before with few changes to religious practices or social order. Although the ruling elite of the Sumerian cities were understandably unhappy at the imposition of new rulers and administrators from outside, it seems that many of the working class in these cities viewed Sargon as a liberator. The distinction between rich and poor in Sumer cities was extreme, and poor people had no way to influence those who ruled. Many saw Sargon in this way because of his beginnings as a working man, as someone who was likely to be sympathetic to their plight. Many of the stories about Sargon stress his sense of fairness to all the people. It is said that under his reign, the poor did not have to beg, and widows and orphans were protected. Taxes were collected in an equitable way, and Sargon and his daughter Enheduanna was installed as the high priestess in the temple of Inanna in the Sumer city of Ur. This was an influential position, and Enheduanna proved to be a significant ally, supporting the actions of her father and ensuring that the temple of his patron god was always behind him in all he did. Sargon also spent time improving and building roads and canals, ensuring that the lands of Sumer became of the most important trade centers in Mesopotamia. He even set up a postal system using special clay envelopes so that the tablets inside could not be read until they arrived at their destination. Sargon was also notable in that he destroyed the outer defensive walls of all the cities he captured, ensuring that it would be difficult for the inhabitants to rise against him. Most conquerors who took city-states in this period would have then selected one as a capital, but this is not what Sargon did. Instead, he established his capital at Akkad, possibly on the western bank of the Euphrates River between the cities of Kish and Sippar. Despite a number of searches, no archaeologist has been able to locate Akkad, which some scholars claim is likely to have been located on the Tigris River. What we do know is that Sargon and his descendants would become inextricably linked with this city. The empire, which Sargon went on to found, is generally known as the Akkadian Empire, and the Semitic language spoken by Sargon and his followers has become known as Akkadian. Sargon was also known as an efficient administrator who learned early the benefits of placing trusted people in charge of the cities over which he had control and of delegating duties to them. It has been said that the rule of Sargon was the first to establish what we now call a bureaucracy to ensure that his laws were enforced and that taxes were collected efficiently. The subjugation of the Sumer cities was carried out with little conflict after the death of Lugal Zagasi. It seems that Sargon simply replaced the previous king and assumed control of his cities with little resistance. However, it quickly became clear that Sargon's ambitions extended well beyond southern Mesopotamia. During this period, the notion of professional soldiers was new. Most armies comprised a small number of trained leaders, followed by large numbers of volunteers who brought with them armor and weapons they owned. Having an army of trained men, especially equipped with advanced weapons technology, who were also trained to fight in formation, would have given Sargon a great advantage in military engagements. These troops also had the advantage of using one of the most powerful handheld weapons of the period, the composite bow. This type of bow was made from wood, horn, and animal sinew. The result is a bow that is compact with great range and power. This combined with the use of bronze-tipped arrows 
which were capable of piercing light armor made a volley of arrows from Akkadian troops, a devastating attack in battle. With his army, Sargon first advanced to Elam, a state comprising a number of kingdoms in what is now the south and southwest of Iran. Sargon quickly defeated the army of King Luhi Ishan and occupied the cities of Susa and Barhasha, installing family members and trusted allies as kings, governors, envoys, and administrators of the captured cities, and made Akkadian the official language of Elam. The capture of Elam was important because it gave Sargon control over several important trade routes and access to the rich resources of the Iranian plateau including timber, something that was always in short supply in the flat plains of Mesopotamia. Having secured Elam and pacified the captured cities there, Sargon turned his attention to the city-state of Mari in northern Mesopotamia, one of the most important trading centers situated on the west bank of the Euphrates River. Mari was one of the oldest cities in the area and a center of bronze smelting and the production of iron goods. Sargon attacked and took the city, partially burning and destroying it in the process. An Akkadian named Idish was appointed as military governor to oversee the reconstruction of the city and its rule on behalf of the Akkadians. With Mari secure, Sargon shifted his attention to the next large trading center in the area, the city of Ebla, to the north of Mari. This city was also quickly pacified and brought under Akkadian control. The capture of Mari and Ebla gave Sargon almost complete control over the vital Euphrates River. He ensured that Akkad became the main trade hub in the area, trading vessels from as far away as Mahula in northwest India, Magan in the Persian Gulf, and Tilman in modern-day Bahrain all regularly called there, and wealth and resources poured into Sargon's growing empire. At around this time, Sargon began to be known as Sargon the Great. In the following years, Sargon continued his conquests, taking his forces into what is now Palestine on the Mediterranean coast, and into the Taurus Mountains of Anatolia, famed for their rich deposits of silver. By the 23rd century BC, Sargon controlled the greatest empire the world had even seen, and the first to use central government control to oversee multi-ethnic conquered lands. Within Akkad and the other cities under Akkadian control, there was peace, and improved trading opportunities brought wealth and employment. Set against this, Sargon's reaction to any hint of insurrection in the lands he controlled was instant and brutal. Anyone who tried to stand against his rule was executed. Life in the Akkadian Empire was good for those who supported Sargon. For those who dared to oppose him, life tended to be very short indeed. Conspiracies and assassinations. Sargon reigned over the empire he had created for more than 50 years. Towards the end of the reign, there were significant rebellions within the empire. However, each one was quickly stopped. Even with Sargon in his 70s, he still led his army against a coalition of forces centered in Elam. However, even Sargon could not live forever, and in 2278 BC, he died. Sargon was an inspirational leader, and his death might have destabilized the empire had it not been for his genius in administration and organization. Even after his death, the bureaucracy and infrastructure he made continued to run smoothly, helping his successors to continue to rule. The first king of Akkad after Sargon was his younger son, Remush. Almost immediately, the new king faced a revolt from some of the cities of Sumer. Records for this period are scarce, but it is believed they were led by wealthy Sumerian families who were forced to accept the imposition of Akkadian governors under Sargon. One of the leaders was Meskigabla of the city of Adabi, who served as a governor under Lugal Zajasi. Perhaps believing that the death of Sargon offered a chance for independence for Sumer, the cities of Adiabi, Lagash, Zabala, Ur, Uma, and Kidingira rose in a united uprising against Akkadian rule. Unfortunately, for the rebels, King Rimush proved just as able as his father as a military leader. During the battles that followed, tens of thousands of Sumerians' troops were killed or captured and deported into slavery. Some historians have estimated that the revolt took up to two zero 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 men, one-third of all men of fighting age from the rebelling Sumerian cities. Having defeated this revolt, Rimush destroyed any defensive structures on the rebel cities and gave trusted friends and family members positions of power in these cities. Just when the Sumer rebellion were crushed, Rimush was faced with another rebellion, this time in the Akkadian city of Kazalu on the Euphrates River. 
He marched north, and in the battle more than 12000 rebel soldiers were killed and more than 5,000 taken as slaves. Rimish also had the city's walls destroyed to prevent any further rebellion there. One year later, Rimish was forced to deal with rebellions in Akkadian-controlled Elam and the nearby kingdom of Parasum. Both were successfully suppressed. Rimish continued to rule and to suppress rebellion for only another six years until his death in 2270 BC. Most agree he was assassinated by members of his royal court. The fact that he was followed by his elder brother Manishtushu has led some historians to speculate that his murder was a part of a plot to bring his brother to the throne. It was certainly odd that Sargon passed the throne to the younger brother. Surviving records, which discuss the reign of Manishtushu, are rare, so we know little of his reign. We do know that there were yet more rebellions during this period, including in the cities of Anshan and Shirakum, but these were relatively small compared to the rebellions which the previous king faced. Manishtushu focused instead on strengthening and expanding the empire. He established trade routes with Egypt and led a large-scale maritime operation in the Persian Gulf, possibly reaching and occupying territory as far as what is now the United Arab Emirates and Oman. He is also said to have sailed down the Tigris River with a mighty fleet with which he plundered silver mines and set up new trade routes. We know that during this period, the Akkadians began using diorite to produce sculptures and obelisks. Diorite is a hard black rock which is difficult to work, but which can be polished to retain a shiny finish. This type of rock is also extremely durable, and some of the scarce information on Manishtushu comes from recovered inscriptions on diorite. One famous example is displayed in the Louvre in Paris. In 2260 BC, an earthquake destroyed the massive temple to the goddess Ishtar in the city of Nineveh. Manishtushu stepped in and ordered the temple complex rebuilt. Nineveh was the center of the cult. Ishtar and the temple built by Manishtushu became the center of one of the most religious sites in this area, when this city later became the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The only other thing we know about King Manishtushu was that despite his quelling of rebellions and new conquests, he too was assassinated after just 15 years as king in 2255 BC. It is thought that like his brother before him, members of the royal entourage may have murdered him, though there is no information to suggest why or who may have done this. Manishtushu was succeeded as king of Akkad by his son Naram-Sin. Naram-Sin would go on to raise the Akkadian Empire to even greater heights, and according to some historians, to eclipse even the achievements of his grandfather. When Naram-Sin became the new king of Akkad, he was faced with yet another series of small-scale rebellions which he quelled in brutal fashion. He took his armies to the Sinai Peninsula to the kingdom of Magan, and there he led his army to victory. The conquest of Magan gave Akkadians access to supplies of copper, which was an important resource for making of weapons and tools. To protect trade routes between Magan and Akkad, Naram-Sin established small garrison towns at regular intervals on major roads. These were occupied by loyal troops whose main function was to protect traders from marauding bandits. Next, Naram-Sin led an expedition comprising a confederation of troops from nine allied city-states, including Sidur and Saluni, into the Zagros Mountains of Iran, where they were defeated and subdued the rebellious Lulubi, a warlike pre-Iranian mountain tribe led by their king, Satuni. To celebrate this victory, Naram-Sin commissioned the building of a large stele, which is a carved stone slab on the site of the main battle. The stele depicted Naram-Sin presiding over a chaotic rabble of terrified individuals being trampled underfoot. During his expedition to Syria, Naram-Sin also attacked and reconquered countries as remote as Afghanistan, Egypt, and Cyprus, in an attempt to ensure that Akkadian cities became the only trading centers in the area. Naram-Sin also led his forces against another warlike mountain tribe, the Guchians, in the Zagros Mountains. These were defeated but not completely subdued, and would continue to pose a threat to the Akkadian Empire for many years to come. Naram-Sin also led an expedition to the Anatolian Plateau, where he met forces from an alliances of 17 local tribes, including the largest, the Hittites, and the Hurrians. The Hittites were led by their king Pamba, and were completely defeated by the Akkadians. 
The Hurrian Kingdom stretched from the Kabur River Valley in the west to the foothills of the Zagros Mountains in the east. These Semitic-speaking people had been allied with the Akkadians, but had seized the opportunity of the death of King Manishtushu to ally with other tribes to make a bid for independence. Again, Akkadian military supremacy meant that Naram Sin defeated the large armies of this confederation of tribes of the Hurrian kings, Zipani of Kanesh. Naram Sin, later in his reign, faced the most significant rebellion of other Sumer city-states against the Akkadians in what became known as the Great Rebellion. The Akkadians met the forces of Iforkis in a large battle near the city of Tiwa. They were victorious and pursued the retreating rebels all the way back to Kish, where a second battle led to the defeat of the rebels and the suppression of the revolt. During Naram Sin's 36-year reign, the suppression of active rebellions in some parts of the empire occupied his attention for at least 20 of those years. Perhaps this was not surprising, given that under Naram Sin, the Akkadian Empire reached its greatest heights covering the Zagros, Taurus, and Aminus Mountains, reaching the shores of the Mediterranean Sea and into modern-day Armenia. It is clear that Naram Sin was a great effective military leader and that the armies were large, well-trained, and well-equipped. However, it was not only war and conquest which received Naram Sin's attention. During his reign, he undertook many significant construction projects, including the building of many roads and canals to facilitate trade and the building of huge temples in the cities of Akkad, Nippur, and Zabala. For the first time in human history under Naram Sin, there also emerged what we would now call a planned economy. The government supported agriculture in all parts of the empire, and an efficient road and canal system meant that surpluses could be distributed to other areas. Grain and oil were distributed in standardized vessels manufactured by government-approved potters. A system of unified dates was also introduced throughout the empire, and each year was named according to notable events such as the year Naram Sin destroyed the city of Ebla. Taxes were paid either in cash or by the provision of labor to build city walls, temples, government buildings, irrigation channels, roads, or transport canals. This centralized planning, combined with fertile lands, ensured there were constant food supplies through his reign. These combined with wealth and resources seized during successful military campaigns ensured that the citizens within the Akkadian Empire rarely went hungry. Each citizen received a government-set ration comprising a fixed quantity of oil and barley. This planned system assured security for the people of the empire and provided massive wealth for a small number of Akkadian artisans, traders, and entrepreneurs. However, there were unsettling undercurrents of hubris. Naram Sin, not content with just being king of Akkad, took a new title of King of the Four Quarters. He claimed that he conquered all the lands surrounding Akkad, including Sumer to the south, Elam to the east, Assyria to the north, and Martu to the west. This title also effectively meant King of the World, in that Naram Sin ruled over most of the civilized lands known to the Akkadians. However, it seems even this was not enough to assuage Naram Sin's growing ego. He later gave himself the title, King of the Universe. However, even this was not enough to satisfy his ego. Thus, he moved to declare himself God to his people. His self-deification worried many of his people who were concerned that such arrogance might anger the gods and bring their wrath down upon Akkad and the empire. When Naram Sin died in 2218 BC, there was no sign that the Akkadian Empire was anything but as powerful and stable as it was. However, there were already hints that things were not as they had been. A few hundred years after the death of Naram Sin's death, a poem was written related to the curse of Akkad. It explained how the gods had become angered by Naram Sin declaring himself God, and then the pillaging of the temple dedicated to the god Enlil in the city of Nippur. Enlil was the chief of the Sumerian pantheon of gods. According to the legend, he persuaded eight of the most significant gods to join with him to ensure the destruction of the city of Akkad and the empire. In the thrilling saga of ancient civilizations, a mystery unfolded, one that confounded historians and archaeologists alike. In the 1970s, when archaeologists set foot upon the ancient city of Shekna, 
ready to unearth the secrets buried beneath its ancient ruins. What they discovered was both astonishing and perplexing. A city that had once thrived had been abandoned, left desolate and devoid of human life. Shekna, which had blossomed from a humble village into a flourishing city-state, had become part of the Akkadian Empire in 2300 BC. However, around 20 years after the death of Naram-Sin, the city was abandoned, leaving behind a silence that echoed through the ages. But Shekna was not alone in its plight. A similar fate befell many northern cities in Mesopotamia during the same period. Entire communities vanished, and signs of farming and agriculture faded into the annals of history. As the archaeologists delved deeper into the enigma of Shekna, they discovered that this puzzling event was not isolated. Across vast lands and distant realms, civilizations were crumbling like ancient statues worn away by the relentless sands of time. In China, the once glorious Longshan culture witnessed a sudden decline, only to be replaced by the simpler Yueshi culture, as revealed by the artifacts left behind. In Egypt, the mighty old kingdom, renowned for its grand pyramids, succumbed to famine and social upheaval, leading to its fragmentation. South Central Asia, too, witnessed a profound shift as sedentary societies yielded to nomadic tribes, wandering with their domestic animals from place to place. In the Indus Valley of India, urban centers, once bustling with life, gradually vanished from the landscape. Even the Arabian Peninsula bore witness to this age of transformation, as the Umm al-Nar culture vanished without a trace. For years, this colossal collapse of civilizations puzzled historians, casting a veil of intrigue over the past. But hidden within the layers of time, a revelation emerged, the 4.2 kilo year event. This climatic upheaval, a dramatic shift in Earth's temperature, occurred approximately every 1,500 years. Its causes remain shrouded in mystery, but its consequences were cataclysmic. At the heart of this upheaval was the cooling of the North Atlantic, an event that triggered a chain reaction of climatic changes across the globe. The bountiful rivers Euphrates and Tigris, lifelines of the Mesopotamian civilizations, were severely impacted. As the surface sea temperature in the northwest Atlantic plummeted, rainfall that fed these mighty rivers dwindled by a staggering 50%. The once fertile lands turned arid, plunging the region into a prolonged period of drought and famine, lasting over a hundred years. The tale of the 4.2 kilo year event serves as a stark reminder of the fragile balance between human ambition and the whims of the natural world. It reminds us that even the mightiest empires are beholden to the caprices of the elements. As we look back upon these ancient civilizations, we bear witness to their struggles, their triumphs, and their ultimate unraveling in the face of an unforgiving climate. The drought was relentless, stretching its cruel grip over a century of hardship. Famine swept across the empire, its insidious grasp tightening with each passing year. The people, once proud and prosperous, now found themselves engaged in a desperate struggle for survival. Migration became the only recourse, as they sought refuge in the southern reaches of Mesopotamia, where water still flowed and hope lingered. Shar Kali Shari and the Cataclysmic Drought The once proud Akkadian Empire, forged through conquest and held together by the might of its kings, found itself teetering on the brink of collapse. Shar Kali Shari, inheriting a troubled realm, faced challenges from all directions. The relentless onslaught of the Guccians, the nomadic tribes from the Zagros Mountains, tested the empire's resilience. These fierce warriors, lacking in sophistication but endowed with remarkable organizational skills, posed a formidable threat to the Akkadians. The Guccians, driven by desperation and hunger, encroached deeper into Akkadian territory. With each passing day they grew more audacious, launching raids and pillaging the resources that were already scarce. Though the Akkadians regarded the Gudians with disdain, their adversaries proved to be cunning and adaptable in the art of war. The Sumerian texts portray the Gudians as a decentralized society, with leadership rotating among different tribes. This fluid structure gave them an advantage in combat, making it difficult for the Akkadians to defeat them decisively. The Gudians were not the only menace plaguing the empire. Shar Kali Shari also faced the challenge of subduing the Amorites, a Semitic people hailing from Syria, and quelling the rebellious Elamites. 
These military campaigns, though initially successful, strained the empire's already depleted resources. As the crop yields dwindled due to the impending drought, the burden of taxation became increasingly unbearable for the Akkadian populace. Faced with mounting hardships, the people rebelled, further exacerbating the empire's internal strife. The onset of the drought in 2200 BCE plunged the Akkadian Empire into a desperate struggle for survival. As the fertile lands turned to dust, food prices skyrocketed and famine loomed over the horizon. The empire, once renowned for its grand construction projects and temples, could no longer spare the resources or manpower for such endeavors. The focus shifted from prosperity to mere subsistence as the people grappled with the daily challenge of securing enough sustenance to survive. Sharkali Shari, a king burdened by the weight of a crumbling empire, passed away in 2193 BCE. By the time of his death, the Akkadian Empire had unraveled completely, consumed by the ravages of drought, famine, and internal strife. The once mighty armies, necessary to defend the empire's borders, were reduced to a shadow of their former strength. Revolts and uprisings swept across the land as those burdened by insurmountable taxes fought against their oppressors. As the Akkadian Empire crumbled under the weight of drought, famine, and internal strife, the stage was set for a period of turbulent transitions and shifting powers. With Shar Kali Shari's demise in 2193 BCE, the realm was plunged into further chaos, exacerbated by the unrelenting grip of the drought. Fertile lands turned barren, forcing people to abandon their homes and seek refuge in the more water-abundant southern regions. However, the influx of refugees only intensified the strain on resources, leading to food shortages even in previously fertile territories. Amidst this dire situation, the empire desperately needed a strong and capable leader to guide it through the storm. Unfortunately, the historical records from this period are scant, leaving us with little insight into the specific turmoil that ensued. Nonetheless, in 2190 BCE, a new king emerged to take the throne. Dudu. However, his ascendancy to power occurred at a time when the empire was already in deep turmoil. Rebellions erupted in Sumerian city-states such as Uma and Girsu, situated on the fringes of Akkadian control. The Elamites, too, rose once more against their Akkadian overlords, seeking an opportunity for independence amidst the crumbling empire. With internal uprisings and external threats, the Akkadian Empire found itself ill-equipped to confront the mounting challenges it faced. Meanwhile, the Gutians, known for their relentless raids, grew more audacious and organized. The continuous raids by these nomadic warriors took a heavy toll on the Akkadians, as they struggled to defend their territories against a relentless foe. Although the Gutians were successful in conquering many Sumerian cities, their lack of agricultural and irrigation knowledge prevented them from maintaining the lands they had seized. Eventually, the kingdom of Akkad itself became a mere shadow of its former glory, reduced to a handful of cities, including Akkad, Kish, Eshnuna, and Tutub. Shuturul, the son of Dudu, ascended the throne in 2168 BCE, but his reign was short-lived. By this time, Akkad was on the brink of collapse, overrun by the Gutians who razed the city to the ground, leaving no trace of its former splendor. The Gutians' rule plunged the region into famine, depopulation, and economic turmoil. As they lacked the interest or means to maintain vital irrigation systems and agricultural infrastructure. However, the Gutians' reign of terror eventually came to an end. The Sumerian city-states, under the leadership of King Utu Hengal from Uruk, rose against their oppressors and defeated the Gutian king, Tirigan. The Gutians retreated to the Zagros Mountains, forever banished from Mesopotamia. Utu Hengal's victory was short-lived, as he was later defeated and replaced by Ur-Namu of Ur, who declared himself the king of Sumer in 2112 BCE, ushering in a period known as Neo-Sumerian. The legacy of the Akkadians lived on, albeit in fragmented forms. The Akkadian language continued to be used in Sumer, even after the collapse of the empire. The remnants of the Akkadian people scattered, with some finding refuge in the northern city of Assur on the banks of the Tigris River. Assur gained independence after the fall of the empire in 2154 BCE 
and eventually became the center of a vast Akkadian-speaking empire, the Assyrian Empire, which would exert political and military influence for a millennium. In the south, the Akkadians gravitated towards the city-state of Babylon. Over time, Babylon rose to prominence, serving as the center of another great empire, the Babylonian Empire. Controlled by the Amorites and Hamitic-speaking peoples from what is now Syria, the Babylonian Empire thrived and exerted its influence across. The region, under the reign of powerful kings like Hammurabi, the Babylonian Empire flourished both politically and culturally. Hammurabi is renowned for his famous Code of Hammurabi, a comprehensive set of laws that laid the foundation for a just and organized society. The empire's capital, Babylon, became a bustling city with magnificent structures, including the iconic Ishtar Gate. The Babylonians embraced a rich and diverse culture, fostering advancements in various fields such as literature, mathematics, astronomy, and architecture. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, symbolized the grandeur and ingenuity of the Babylonian civilization. However, the Babylonian Empire too would eventually face its own challenges and decline. External pressures and internal power struggles weakened the empire, leaving it vulnerable to conquest. In 1595 BCE, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Kassites, a group of people from the Zagros Mountains. The Kassite dynasty would rule over Babylon for several centuries, maintaining a degree of stability and prosperity. Throughout history, empires rise and fall, leaving their marks on the annals of civilization. The Akkadian Empire, once a formidable force, crumbled under the weight of drought, famine, and internal strife. Yet, the legacy of the Akkadians endured through the subsequent rise of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, each contributing their own unique chapters to the tapestry of Mesopotamian history. The rise and fall of the Akkadian Empire is a remarkable tale of human achievements and the forces of nature. From its humble beginnings as a small city-state to becoming a sprawling empire, Akkad left an indelible mark on history. Its advancements in governance, military prowess, and cultural achievements set the stage for future civilizations. The empire's downfall serves as a stark reminder of the delicate balance between human endeavors and the environment. The 4.2 kilo year event, a significant climate shift that led to prolonged droughts and crop failures, dealt a severe blow to the Akkadian Empire. The once fertile lands between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers turned into arid wastelands, leading to famine, social unrest, and the collapse of the empire. It is fascinating to consider how such a powerful and influential empire could be brought to its knees by environmental factors beyond human control. The Akkadians, despite their military might and administrative capabilities, were ultimately at the mercy of the natural world. The rivers that once nourished their civilization ran dry, leaving behind a trail of devastation and upheaval. Yet the legacy of Akkad lives on. Its innovations in governance, military strategies, and cultural achievements left an enduring impact on subsequent civilizations. The Akkadians laid the groundwork for future empires to build upon, contributing to the development of ancient Mesopotamia as a cradle of civilization. The rise and fall of the Akkadian Empire we are reminded of the intricate interplay between human ambition and the forces of nature. It serves as a cautionary tale, urging us to recognize the importance of sustainable practices and environmental stewardship. The story of Akkad teaches us that even the most powerful empires are not immune to the whims of nature and that we must strive for balance and harmony with the world around us. So let us learn from the rise and fall of Akkad appreciating the achievements of our ancestors while humbly acknowledging our place within the grand tapestry of time. As we forge ahead, let us seek to build a future that is both prosperous and in harmony with the delicate ecosystems that sustain us.